Welcome to JLive. I'm Laura Mandel, JRS Executive Director. It's great to be with you for JLive today. This is our virtual series of bite-sized conversations about Jewish life and art with the best artists with Boston Connections. Um, before we get into anything else, I just wanna note we are having some internet issues today. So if for any reason this goes out, I assure everyone on today um, that we will record and send a video out after. So please don't worry about that. Um, but today I am lucky to be with woodworker Eugene Zeleny, who I actually met a few years ago through a project we did together with Jay Arts and Moisha House. Hey, Eugene. So Eugene Hi, is a, it's great. And, and I want everyone to know he is a woodworker, but he's also what I would call a maker generally, um, just a, a jack of many trades. So it's really cool to be with you today. All right, so let's get okay. to know you a little through your work first. So um, first, um, I love these bottle openers you made. So let's look at those and start there. So these are a pile of bottle openers that I made for a Moisha House Russian speaking Jewish retreat a number of years ago. And the theme the retreat was you know, Russian Jewish heritage and a connection to it. And if you look closely at the nails on these bottle openers, uh, they look kind of old uh, and an odd shape, and that's because my grandfather, uh, when we emigrated from the former Soviet Union, brought those nails with him because after living in the Soviet Union, he didn't know what the availability of nails and tools would be in America, and thankfully there's abundance. Uh, but he ended up saving those nails in a tin in a closet until I found them after he passed, and I thought that integrating these symbols of like a Russian Jewish diaspora of our tradition or heritage into this like bite-sized handheld tool to take with us after this retreat was a very relevant, very important part um, of our history and as a way to show like, hey, here's what we went through, take it home with you. And it's a way for everyone to have a piece of that history with them. That's so cool. I mean, it's amazing how much we now know about you as a person and an artist just from this. And I love that you burned that. That's the Moisha House logo on those. Is that right? Hand, hand burned each one, not laser cut, hand burned. <laughs> amazing. All right. So let's look. Um, I love these drinking dreidels that you made. Let's look at those next. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so as a part of being Moshe House resident, I was teaching a lot of workshops, specifically woodworking, and using kind of a very traditional way of making a traditional toy, but integrating new games or not necessarily Hebrew words. Like you don't want to have to have people learn Gimel or Shin, but having it be transferable into like a fun millennial kind of game gives access to that history with a modern twist and gives people more of an uh, idea of like how to lean into their Jewish culture, Jewish heritage through modern means. And it's, it's really fun. cool because they're a very traditional dreidel shape and yet there's nothing else traditional about them. <laughs> really? I like makes things traditional and the new, uh, you know, both cultures coming together into one. Okay, so when you're talking about blending cultures and traditional and new, I think it's hilarious that you built a sauna for your Moisha house. Let's look at it and tell us about it. <laughs> yes. We did. So that was a, a very big project. We, you know, got funded on Indiegogo by a community. We asked Moshe House for extra funding. We had three events where you did a, you know, combined building, assembly, testing events with Moshe House. Um, we designed it to be collapsible and portable so that when we did move, uh, we were able to put it on a trailer and take it with us to the next place we would live. Uh, and yeah, we engaged the community, um, Jewish, non-Jewish, Russian, non-Russian, just everyone who was interested in it learned not only building techniques, but a bit of Russian culture uh, and just created a much bigger social project than we expected to. It was great. That's really cool. And I know, I mean, I in college used to go to the Russian bathhouses with very dear friends of mine in New York. And I know that that is a very yeah. Russian culturally traditional thing. So I think it it's so cool that you brought it here. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about who you are through your work, um, I really want to talk about Expedition Maker. And I think a lot of us watching may not even know what that is. Sure. Tell us about Expedition Maker, what it is, and what that experience was like. All right, so through Moshe House's, uh, I think, subsidiary Camp 999, they held an online Jewish crafting competition uh, during quarantine as a way to get this community engaged because they couldn't do anything live or in person. So they thought, hey, let's just do a reality show online. And here it actually is an example of one of my projects I built there. So every week we'd be given a, a prompt as a way to kind of build a project. And at the end of the week, we'd have a project built, record all the pictures, all the videos, and just submit it so they could 
film and edit their, uh, their part of the show. And so this project was specifically designed as the prompt for masks. So I thought it'd be very cool to create this mask. I'll actually show you as a mean. And I just have to say that was around Purim, right? The masks were relating to yes, Purim. It I was. Think. So Purim mm -hmm. was also a big part of the theme. So using this mask as a way to show, to create like protection from the world while integrating really interesting crafting methods. I mean, I used leather, uh, LEDs. Uh, I use 3D printed parts. It's actually 3D printed wood filament. So it actually can be stained like regular wood, uh, foam. Uh, so basically taking the, the essence of crafting, all these different techniques, all these different methods and materials and integrating them together into a single project was like the goal of uh, make Expedition Maker to show everyone else out there in the world, you know, you have all this time during quarantine, get into crafting. It's super fun and you make really neat things with it. That's cool. And I will recommend that if every, anyone watching this series, please go online and watch it. It was really an incredible opportunity to see how many of you were there? 10 makers initially? Is yeah, that there right? Were 10 competitors, correct. Yep. And they were from all over the place, yep. but I will say there was a disproportionately high number of you from the Boston area, which made me especially proud. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> It was great. God, it was so fun. We, we totally bonded over like being in the same place together. Like, oh yeah, we should totally hang out after this is done, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and one of your fellow competitors, Mia Schoen, we work with regularly and, and Hillel That's Smith, awesome. I, I know, know is that. another one we've worked with. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's, there's a lot of overlap there. And I know. Oh, um, Hillel, Hillel is great. I love working with him. Uh, during the whole competition, we ended up having like powwows. We're just like brainstorm or work together remotely. Um, He actually turned me on to a bunch of other lighting designs. So Hillel is a you know general artist extraordinaire also. I'm a big fan of him. Um, and he yeah. works specifically with like LED and art installations. And he introduced LED party balls, which are just super light, half inch in diameter. And they're usually designed for like balloons at parties, but they're such a small and easy form factor and they last for days. You can use them as jewelry, as accents to, you know, fashion pieces. There's an infinite amount of possibilities. And like, I'm very happy he turned me on to these. Check him out, hillilsmith.info. Look at his art, it's wonderful. Yeah, I know, I couldn't agree more. His work is incredible. And I think, I love how you all connected and bonded through this series because each yeah. each of you do do such different work. Yeah. And all I know having talked to Mitt, yeah. yeah, it's it's really incredible to watch you, you all in, in process and in action, yeah. all prompted by these, these Jewish prompts. I thought yeah. that was just so, really so, cool. Yes, yeah, so it's the same prompt every week and all of us reacted with such different ideas concepts mm -hmm. based on our history, our geography, our culture. And it was mind blowing to see a variety of just 10 people. Yeah. Well, and I'm kind of curious coming out of that experience, did that inspire you to make other types of Jewish work or has it redirected you in any way in your making? I mean, definitely with the LEDs, I've been making a lot more yeah. I mean, with this guy. He'll actually inspire me to put LEDs on the inside, which helps. So cool. um, we're just using different ways of using light to highlight other features either of your body or other accent and art pieces um, and a much smaller palatable art. Um, there's so much big art big installations in the world um, but I feel like there is always on the personal art, the personal highlights, the personal art mushrooms in the woods and glowing bugs in the trees and creating like mystical and whimsical ambiance is I think my new favorite thing that I'm doing running theme on J lives of my obsession with meow wolf and it sounds like a jewish yes, meow wolf yes. installation <laughs> possible like very easy to set up lightweight cheap these are like the the design constraints i'm working with right now that's really interesting very cool back a ways how did you come to woodworking oh that was let's see so my niece is 12 right now uh so 13 years ago uh my sister now she was pregnant and that made me realize, oh, I'm going to be influencing a little person in the world. Uh, I want to be a good and positive influence. And at the same time, I had my first mentor in engineering, and he led me to woodworking, being a very crotchety old Portuguese carpenter. <laughs> and he gave me a very good, easy baby steps to follow as a 19-year-old. You know, look at this website, buy this tool, go to the market. And that, you know, helped foster my growth and my interest in tasks and made me realize, oh, I can just build my niece gifts every year and, like, help her be more in tune with not only their culture and made things because uh, there's such importance in making things for yourself and for others. So I've made her handmade gifts for every that she's been alive so far. And I think that's very special. 
That's awesome. We share that in common. I make art for my niece and nephew every year and it's the most special thing. That's totally. Awesome. And also yeah. you mentioned your- And now, now actually, yeah. as, as an aside, uh, I'm currently teaching at a summer camp right now and my niece is taking my woodworking class and it makes me so proud. That's some. It's, it warms my heart so much. Um, right now, some kazoos, to be honest, they just, one kid built his kazoo and finished the first day and like played it. And then everyone's building kazoos and like door stops, uh, passive amplifiers, uh, spoons. People love spoons. Cool. So the kids are really listening. It's Wow. And that's great because it's, you know, pay it forward, pass on these traditions. Exactly. So, because I love that exactly. earlier you mentioned that the nail. This came from your grandfather, and you you did mention that your grandfather had some skill and expertise in the area of woodworking. Yes. So tell me. Yeah. So my grandfather, in my adult life, only influenced me by leaving me his tools. Uh, but when the Soviet Union, after the war, he was a carpenter at like various factories for making doors, and then he was a cobbler for a good amount of times. So I still have his cobbling hammers too, which I don't really use, but I'm really happy that I have them. Um, and it's only funny how in my teenage years, I learned that my grandfather brought these tools with him to the Soviet, to America. Um, my dad said, hey, if these, these you want to use them, you can use them. I go, well, why are using them? <laughs> I guess it just skips a generation. Yeah, totally. But how cool is that to reuse things that were your grandfather's? I mean, yeah. and how special. I mean, it, Jewishly thinking of the, you know, from Jew it's the definition of. Absolutely. And I still have, I like, guess, old screws i have his old hammer which i use almost like every time i'm in the shop like that and it's such a, it's a solid some things back then were actually built to last <laughs> it's true oh that's so funny so okay so speaking of your russian heritage you are one of the founders of our russian speaking moisha house here in boston so tell us a little yes, bit about it correct. so i founded it uh three years ago with my friend susie saligan and danny chernobylsky and like I said, we built that sauna uh, with my most recent new roommates, uh, Alec Hudson and Alex Grebov. Um, and it's been a wonderful time. I definitely have blossomed uh, in terms of teaching people, which is what led me to be a teacher in all my other facets. Uh, and it's helped me like, again, foster that creativity and get more connected to my Jewish heritage uh, through the teaching and the woodworking. Because prior to woodworking and making Judaic, I didn't really have as much of a connection, but Moshe House, Pretty much prompted that connection by challenging me to say hey we have this option for you to make these five events six events a month what are you interested in teaching and woodworking was something i knew very well back then so i thought why not just try teaching a class and one class turned into two classes and all of a sudden i had one monthly class for three years and wow. yeah it was a great great amount of work to be done and we did collaborations with other moisture houses in boston um with brookline house we collab on a accessibility ramp to go up their stairs on their porch to have people um in wheelchairs to come to their event I've helped build, you know, variety of Judaica, dreidels, menorahs. I've influenced people to make their own little um, Hanukkah. Um, I'm just really, once you teach someone to use a very basic tool and they, oh, they get it and they keep using it without your help, all of a sudden, oh, they can make things themselves now. Uh, and the barrier to entry and crafting and making feels huge. It feels almost impossible to get into without inherent knowledge, but no. Go to a flea market, buy a cheap hammer and a screwdriver, get a nail on a board, just start hammering. You'll figure it out. YouTube, honestly, YouTube has so many tutorials. That too. There's like, is much smaller than people believe it to be. I bet you comes through in your work. I mean, we were just talking about your Etsy store and how you've just made yeah. things and thrown them up there. I mean, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like variety. So, uh, <laughs> One of my, I wouldn't call it a, my attention span is relatively short with projects. So I just like cranking out projects as fast as possible. I mean, a, the Banya was like three months and you can't, you can't rush a Banya project, but I just like variety. And like, if I see a new idea, like Hills, you know, influenced these lights, he gave me these lights ideas, like the first week of Expedition Maker. And I thought, oh, what else can I do with these? So I've literally been buying hundreds of these and just experimenting with different form factors, features, paper cutouts, cardboard cutouts, 3D printed parts. What can I do with these? And there's so much. And there's going to be so much more to explore years down the line. I haven't even started touching electronic Arduino programming control. Just it's like the cusp of it. I'm just learning so much as being with these. All right. So tech stuff is up next. <laughs> Up next, yeah, learning. I've got leather working. I've been metal working in the past year. Uh, 3D printing has been the past year. So I think Arduino and electronics control is, I think, the next journey uh, with crafting and creating for me. That's awesome.
I love that. And just so everyone knows, put your Etsy link um, into the chat. If anybody's <laughs> so yeah, some Thanks cool little so cool little things on there. And yes, I you also will take do commissions. I also like, I'm a big fan of doing custom commissions. So if you just reach out to me, uh, my personal email, if you have an idea for something, if you just want like research feedback, I have a knowledge in a vast variety of manufacturing processes. If you have a problem or a question on how to make something, just ask, I'm available. Cool. Well, that was the other thing I really appreciated on Expedition Maker was that you were figuring it out as you went. You're very much, let me figure out what I want to make and how I'm going to get there. Yeah. Wow, very Absolutely. cool. Yeah, it was definitely, Expedition Maker challenged me, like I never built something that was a combination of all these different materials before in four days, I think it was five days. Wow. We like got our prompts on like a Sunday, I had to finish it by a Thursday. So yeah, it was a big challenge, but that kind of like pressurized time sensitive challenges, like where really you get creative, interesting ideas that like influence you way down the line. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, there's a question in the chat here. We're curious to know, what was the process sure. like to get into Expedition Maker? <laughs> uh, just being very loud. <laughs> so I was a Moish House resident for a number of years. Um, and then the, the workshops I did started making waves because like I was pretty much the only person doing woodworking workshops in all of Moisha House as a resident. And after that, um, I got hired to work Camp 999 on the logistics team. And that just like spread my word and I put our installations there. And for Yana Tomachova's uh, the nail bot, the nail bottle openers, I made those for Russian Jews and they took those mm -hmm. all over the country with them. So I think just you know, <laughs> slowly small influences here and there yeah. really helped me to become a member of the show. Yeah, that's very cool. Baby I mean, stuff, all baby stuff. Oh, yeah, but it's, no, I love how all of your experiences are so interesting yeah. because oh, yeah. you're a maker, you know, you're very, you know, solid as a Russian Jew and what that means to you. And I, and I love how you're using your work yeah. to share the many facets of your identity. That's really special. Yeah, thank you. That's um, exactly it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Let's see, hold on, we have another question here. Somebody else would like to know, where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Kiev, Ukraine. I moved to America in the, the Jewish diaspora, uh, to Boston when I was four years old. And I've been living in Boston ever since. And I've jumped between, I've bounced between uh, Brookline, Brighton, Newton, Somerville, currently where I'm living now, um, Medford, so all over the place. Nice. And we are just about out of time, but I, someone else would like to know, yeah. what are you working, other than working at camp, of course, what else are you working on right now? Any big projects uh, coming so, up? Yes, I just finished building a fire staff, my very first fire staff. And I'm gonna be practicing how to spin fire uh, on the waterfront where it's safe, safety first. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's my big part, just learning how to spin better and actually wow. dance with fire. That's my big one. And then probably more fire staff because they're much easier than you think they are. <laughs> ha okay. I have to ask this, logistically, how does that work? What are you building and what uh, are you burning? <laughs> uh, so basically it acts like a, like a torch from the old fashioned movies where you put like a wick on the end of a metal pole and secure it and you okay. dip it in like white fuel. You just light it up and it burns off and the wick stays the same after it's uh, dried off. You need like a kit, you need wet towels to put the fire out, you need a cup to dip the wick in for soaking it in. Uh, you know, you gotta have a wireless speaker for the whole kit. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> but it's well worth it. Very cool. Can't wait to see that. <laughs> All right. So before I, be go, before I let you go, before I let you go, I have one important comment, which is this bow tie is fabulous. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I hated learning how to tie bow ties and neckties. So I just sort of did them myself. It's easy now. That's great. And I know we were saying before <laughs> that those have become trendy, but I think you were a bit of a trendsetter yes. on this one. Thank you. Uh, I'll wear my necktie next time. It stretches. That's great. So are you making these bow ties for other people or just for yourself? For myself and like custom commissions for friends and people who order them online. Absolutely. Cool. That's awesome. All right. Well, Eugene, this has been so much fun. I highly encourage so everyone both to check out Eugene's Etsy shop or to come to him for custom yeah. commissions, but also <laughs> check out Expedition Maker. Um, it's really it's a very cool show and opportunity. And I, I was inspired by the Jewish prompts and I loved what you made. So um, I'm glad we had the chance to talk. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. So 
Um, before we go, as always, I feel the need to say, um, J Live and other J Arts programming cannot happen without generous support from people like all of you. So if you've enjoyed what you studied today, please consider making a donation on the J Arts website and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Eugene. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you soon. Bye.